But here's the question. When bad things happen to me, is it okay to be mad at God? One. All right. Number two. Is it okay to be mad at the circumstance? Number three. Is there a way to be both not mad at God and mad at the circumstance? Or are those two conflicting emotions? Is there an inherent tension between the two? Number four. Do I need to find a way to be pleased with both Allah and both with the circumstance? So the goal is to get to contentment, to ridla. Now, there's something inherently contradicting about this subject in the very first place. Your purpose in life is not to be happy. That's a really difficult thing to come to terms with because everything is supposed to be about making us happy. You're not here to be happy. Your purpose is not to be happy. That your purpose is not to serve yourself until you are happy. And as long as you're happy, it doesn't matter if the entire world is burning down or if I'm not realizing my true purpose. Happiness is a side effect of living a life of purpose. But happiness is not the goal of life. We want to be happy. It's nice to be happy. It's nice to feel fulfilled. But at the same time, it's not the ultimate goal, right? So the idea that you first start off from is that what is my purpose and how do I connect my purpose with contentment? So I asked four questions that I want us to address sort of as we go through the reflections tonight. And there are some other questions. You start off with this. Do you see yourself as a servant of Allah or do you see Allah as your servant? In other words, are you here to please Allah or are you here for Allah to please you? These are essential questions that you have to ask yourself when you're talking about this concept of ridha, contentment. Because right away, if the title of the lecture says how to be content, how to be fulfilled, you start thinking that it's going to be a bunch of tips on how to attain happiness in life. But I'm actually starting off on the premise that the goal is not to be happy in life. The goal is to live a life of purpose. Happiness comes as a result of living a life of purpose, but that's not the goal of life and it's problematic when you approach that as the goal of life. Ibn al-Qayyim rahimahullah mentions that a person who knows their purpose is pleased so long as that purpose is not compromised. So a person who knows their purpose in life is pleased so long as their purpose in life is not compromised. And so what saddens that person is distance from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, is feeling a distance from God. That's what saddens that person, or feeling distant from that purpose. That I'm either distant from the Creator, or I'm distant from the path to that Creator. All right? That's what brings me a true sense of sadness. If everything else is okay, but he feels distant from Allah, he's not okay. If everything else is okay, but he feels distant from Allah, then he's not okay. So let's think about this in the sense of repentance. We said that one of the greatest flaws in how we approach repentance is that you think you're only supposed to repent when you do something bad. And so repentance is a guilt, uh, a guilt-driven concept in Islam. And that's wrong. Repentance is not only out of guilt. Repentance means that you're ever turned towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, feeling like you owe Him so much more and that you could do your best and feeling deficient, not because He guilts you, but because of the supreme mercy that He shows towards you. So you're always turned towards him. So repentance is not a negative emotion only in Islam. Turn back to God or else. Turn back to Allah or else. And you know, you're a filthy person, so make istighfar, right? That's not how repentance is defined with Islam. Similarly, in this subject, when do people start asking questions about purpose? And when do people start asking questions about why? And how do I gain fulfillment from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? It's when other things start to fall apart. Okay? Meaning what? If everything's good with my career, family, health, I've got it all, then I'm not likely to turn towards faith for anything. Because I say, you know what, I've already, you know, I'm, I'm good. I'm set on this part. But I'm still feeling disturbed. I'm not fulfilled, and I'm wondering why probably, but at the same time, there is no induced emotion of how do I get close to the Creator again. But in the case of the believer, if everything else is okay, but they still feel a gap between them and Allah, they're not content. 
They're not satisfied. They're not pleased. It doesn't matter if everything else is okay. This is not okay. Therefore, I'm not okay. But with that believer, if everything else is falling apart, but they feel connected to their Creator, then they are, and put this in quotation marks, okay. Even if everything else is not okay. Now again, I'm going to come back to the essential question though. Does that mean I have to be pleased with the circumstances that I have or not? Okay. Does that mean I need to be pleased with the circumstances? Or does that mean that I need to be pleased with Allah despite the circumstances? The whole point that Ibn al-Qayyim is making is that is your purpose compromised in your tragedy or misfortune or not? And that is the core meaning of the Prophet, peace be upon him, saying, عَجَبًا لِأَمْرِ mu'min, How amazing is the affair of the believer. If good comes to him, then he is grateful. He praises Allah and he's grateful and that's better for him. And if hardship comes to him, he is patient and he praises Allah and that's better for him. Meaning what? Everything else can be stripped away from you and taken away from you, but your purpose is still sound. There's a very famous incident of the great scholar Ibn Taymiyyah rahimahullah that was jailed for his principles, tortured, and he's standing in the courtroom. And as he's standing in the courtroom and people are talking about the various forms of torture that they're going to inflict upon him, he says, what can my enemies do to me? My Jannah is in my heart. Meaning my paradise is inaccessible to you and there are no circumstances that could possibly rob my heart of that Jannah. In Naqatri Shahada. Kill me and I'm a martyr. Kill me and I'm a martyr. You're not sacri- you know, my whole life is based upon that purpose. So if you take my life for that purpose, I'm okay. Qatli Shahada. Kill me, I'm a martyr. Alright? By the way, Muslims, we, we don't have a death cult. We don't go searching. We try to live for Allah. We don't go searching for ways to die for Allah. Let's make that very clear. All right? So Ibn Taymiyyah was not searching for a way to die. He actually was pretty keen to live to do good things. But hey, you know what? Go ahead. Kill me and, my, and I'm a martyr. Qatli shahada. Deport me. Send me to some strange land. And you know what? That'll be a chance to contemplate and explore the rest of the earth and contemplate the signs of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I'll be fine. I don't need this place. I can go anywhere and I'll be just fine. Because my happiness is not contingent upon the place that I'm in. I can find happiness wherever you send me and I can find appreciation of the signs of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala around me. So go ahead and deport me. I'll be fine. And he said, if you put me in jail, then it's a chance to be secluded with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And the only company I need is the company of God. So my jannah is in my heart, my paradise is in my heart. You don't have access to that because my happiness does not depend upon people or circumstances around me. It's here and it's inaccessible to you. So do with me what you want. That does not mean Ibn Taymiyyah did not struggle in prison. Some of the most heartbreaking letters, if you ever read the letters that he wrote to his mother from prison, they were difficult years for him. That doesn't mean he didn't struggle in torture. But what that meant was, he had a sense of purpose that kept his heart beating despite all of that, to where despite those hardships, he could say, I'm okay. Alhamdulillah, I'm okay. Yes, I'm struggling, but I'm okay. I've got something here that's absolutely inaccessible to everyone around uh, around me. And as long as that is sound, everything else is going to be sound. Does be, is it okay to be angry at Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala himself? No. Alright? Showing anger towards Allah presumes that you understand something that He doesn't. That's one option. So that you have a better assessment of the circumstances than He does, which is impossible. Because his knowledge is not limited like yours, nor is his sight limited like yours, nor is his hearing limited like yours, nor is his time limited like yours. So Allah knows what you don't know. So that's one option. So you're either presuming that you know something that he doesn't know. So that's why your anger towards him is justified. All right. Or two, that Allah acted towards you out of a sense of cruelty or a sense of hatred or a sense of punishing you. And by the way, I'm going to get to one of the worst flaws of preaching that takes place by all forms of religious preachers, which is that when you suffer, it's because Allah is punishing you. 
That's a way to turn, that's a way to run someone away from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala really quick. And it's flawed. It's a very flawed understanding because the Prophet said, Allah abdam, if Allah loves someone, ibtala, Allah tests him. So you're presuming, you, you might be presuming that the hardship that's coming to you is coming from a place of cruelty and a place of hardship. So you're blaming, you, you are making assumptions on the attributes of Allah or suggesting that Allah's attributes are incomplete. All right. Another possibility that can come from that is that you are saying to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, if you show that anger towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that he was unjust to you. You're claiming that an injustice has been, been done to you by him. So there are three essential flaws to approaching the divine in that capacity, being mad at Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And I share this because, and I've shared this story, some of you might have heard it, um, and it was one that, that really, um, that, that I, and, and wallahi, I'm not making it up. All right, so just to be very clear, because some of you might be like, this can't really be, this really happened to me, all right? Sitting in a room with a bunch of clergy, and um, it was grief counseling, and the grief, the grief counselor teaching us how to be better grief counselors, and the grief counselor said, you know what the problem with do clergy is? You don't teach people that sometimes they need to be mad at God. They need to tell God, God, I don't like you right now. I'm not happy with what you're doing right now. And I'm sitting there going, this woman is crazy, right? And then I look around and everyone's going. <laughs> and I'm like, how do you teach people <laughs> to, to be okay? If you're clearly not okay, right? So, no, wait, that's flawed. You can't reduce Allah to that because what's the point of having a God that's incapable or cruel? Because that's the inherent suggestion. The implicit suggestion is that he's either incapable of doing something right or that he's intentionally doing something wrong and painful and harmful to you. That doesn't make any sense whatsoever. So, no, you don't get to do that. And it goes back to the very first premise. Contentment, fulfillment. You don't say to Allah, why did you do this to me? You say to Allah, what do you want from me so that I may live up to it? Because you're ultimately the master and I'm here to serve. So when I don't understand things, when I don't understand why you are doing things, I can still fall back on your attributes and your names.